Teresa Copeland, and I want to invite you to my show, The Big Sell. Are you ready to stop being a small player in a big world? Are you ready to decommoditize your business? Are you ready to stand aside from the competition? Join me every week on The Big Sell. Hi, everybody. It's Lisa Copeland, and welcome to The Art of The Big Sell where we interview people, where I talk to people who have the big idea, and the big idea is what is absolutely critical for success. I'm really excited today that I've got a good friend of mine on the show, uh, Mr. Brian Benstock, the Vice President and General Manager of Paragon Honda and Acura, who is consistently in the top five in the nation, month in and month out. Um, but that's not what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about the big idea, the big idea that Brian and his team put into action that is what propelled their success. I mean, Brian is a national speaker. You know, he is highly sought after at every single automotive convention. It's just, you know, Brian Benstock is the keynote speaker. He's definitely the man of the hour right now. Uh, Brian, welcome to the Art of the Big Sell. Welcome, really happy to be here, Lisa. Well, and thank you for the kind words. Well, I'll tell you, everybody out there, when they say, you know Brian Benstock, can you introduce me to him? And I said, not unless you can bring him a lot of value. He's a busy guy, and he's out to disrupt uh, the entire automotive industry. So I want to hear it, because I, I love to tell your story, but I want to hear it from your perspective, the disruption. I think you tell the story better than I do, <laughs> but, uh, but I'll... Um... Yeah. I'll, I'll play along today and I'll tell the story a little bit. Now, first of all, I don't think that um, we disrupt. I think that the customers disrupt. Um, you know, so for me to set out with an idea of disrupting or coming up with something I think is going to be disruptive, it's not up to, to us. It's up to the customers. And the customers either like and accept an idea or they reject it. And when they accept the idea uh, and they accept it in mass, that's where you have some disruption. So uh, I, I'm only hopeful that we can have a positive impact on causing customers to accept something and then potentially move into a different direction. Uh, our uh, concept is really nothing new, but it's uh, new for automotive. I think customers are, are looking at time today as a commodity. Time is a new currency. You know, forget this Bitcoin stuff that I don't understand. I, I do understand time and everybody wants and needs more. And I, I think there's now a push for us to make better use of consumers' times, uh, and and there's just no reason to visit the dealership for so many of the things that we force our customers to come to the stores to do. I'm going to tell you a funny story that I I have forgotten to tell you. I was in New York last week, and my Uber driver that was taking me to JFK, he was in a new Honda, and it was fairly new. It didn't have tag, you know, it didn't have uh, white or paper tags on it, but it was a plated car. And I said, oh my gosh, I said, what a really good friend of mine. Oh, I asked him where he lives, and he said he lives in Queens. And I said, well, a good friend of mine is the general manager of Paragon Honda. Did you buy it from Paragon? He said, no, I bought it from their competitor. But I'll tell you what, I just found out that they, ran, that they run service 24 hours a day. So I am going to serve. So he, he, he's already used your um, red cap and Paragon yeah. Direct for the service piece of it. And he was so blown away. And he said, you know what? But I know this. I know I'm going to buy my next one there. And that was well, like unsolicited. That's great to hear. I'm sorry we lost them on on the sales side of it. But, you know, again, I he think he never even uh, went there, so it wasn't that he lost them. It just you know, he just yeah. wasn't aware. But but what is what is going to own him for the rest of his Honda owning life? And he loves his Honda. And honestly, it was it was the cleanest Uber I'd ever been in in my life. He even had the wheels dressed. I was like, oh my gosh. So, but what, yeah. what will keep him forever? And he will, now he'll buy from you is your service and what you're doing with that 24 hour service and the convenience you're offering. Let's talk about Uber drivers. That car is how they earn their living. And they, they really don't want to. It's unacceptable for them to not earn while their car is being serviced. So what if we could take the customer's cars at night uh, when the Uber driver is potentially sleeping, repair the car, and or make or do the maintenance that we need to do for the car, and then bring it back to them while they're resting. They wake up and they can keep going. Their car can be in, in use all the time. And another thing to keep in mind with the Uber drivers, it's, you know, we love Uber and, yeah. and uh, the, the, these drivers purchase at a more rapid pace than traditional customers, and their servicing needs are three to four times greater. So there's a real need for those customers, and there's a real benefit to the dealership. 
Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, for him, it was an absolute game changer when he found out that you, what you guys do. And, you know, you don't have to be an Uber driver to want convenience. I'm going to tell him myself, but I drive a Mercedes and I have had a light on in my car, something about coolant levels. I mean, here's me, the ex-car dealer. And it's been on for, I don't know, three months through about nine freezes. But I'm too busy to go to the Mercedes dealership to go drop it off. So I'm hoping that my car doesn't blow up. But if I was your client, I'd make the phone call. You guys would have a courier come pick up my car, service it, and bring it back to me. Like while I was sitting here filming this show with you. Yeah, so I mean, unbelievable. 95% of the time your car is just sitting. Nobody is doing anything with that car. So why don't we make better use of that time? And why don't we service your car during that time? Uh, the same thing if you're going to sell the car. Why don't we take all the pictures, put them up online, and sell it for you without you ever having to come to the dealership and, and pick up the car and give you a check if, if you wanted to do that. Or if you wanted to test drive a car. Well, why don't we just bring it to you to test drive? See how it looks. See if it fits in your driveway. See if you like it in front of the house. See if the color is the right color for you. Matches well, you know, what, what uh, your house looks like. And if not, take it back and we'll send you a different car. There's just not the same need to go to the dealership today that there once was. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I want to go back. So I met you in 2012 at Automotive Leadership Roundtable uh, that is uh, put on by our good friend Sean Wookington and Justin Bird and, and that whole team um, oh, at Tier yeah. 10. Yeah. And they, they're amazing. And you were one of the keynote speakers, as was I, and you talked about, so this was in 2012, and you were there speaking and the Boston Marathon nightmare you know the bombings had just happened yeah, yeah, and yeah, you were supposed to be at the boston marathon but sean had asked you to speak at this event because it was so important to the audience to hear what you had to say and he got you into the london marathon instead and you agreed to do it i want you to tell your side of that story because it, it has stayed with me what is this you know four years five years it was so impactful I, I don't remember what year was it 2012 but yeah. it was it was the unfortunate day of the, the, the bombing. But I can tell you that um, I was scheduled to go to the Boston Marathon and it happened to com uh, be in conflict with the date of the ALR uh, round table. And I said to Sean, well, listen, I've been training for 14 weeks for this marathon and I'm gonna go to the marathon. And you know, typical Sean, well, isn't there just another marathon you can run? I said, training <laughs> for this one. And, uh, but I said, there isn't back one, but it's in London and it's sold out. And he said, well, if I could get you into the London Marathon, would you come speak at ALR? I said, Sean, it's never going to happen. That thing was sold out months in advance. But if you can, I will. Uh, Sean, of course, is you know rel relentless. If he gets his mind fixed on something. Uh, and powerful. Oh, my God. Passionate about it. Yes. And I remember Sean calling me a couple of days before the marathon saying, I've got good news and I've got better news. And I said, well, what's the good news? The good news is I got you into the London Marathon. I said, what's the better news? I got you a really cool name. He said, you got me a cool name? He said, yes, you're going to be running for a charity and uh, somebody is exchanging the bib and that person's name was Bond, Ed Bond. And he said, so I think it's pretty cool that you're going to be Bond in the London Marathon. <laughs> I said, okay, Sean, I'll, I'll, run, I'll run that and I'll be able to speak at ALR. And as it turns out, um, I'm sitting in the audience like you were uh, during that meeting and I'm getting text messages from friends of mine that are running that something just happened. And as it turns out, of course, there was a horrific bombing at the uh, uh, Boston Marathon. And I was scheduled to run that race. And who knows what could have or would have happened had I been there at that time. And, you know, and I usually go with my family and my God forbid we were there. So in, oh. in essence, Sean's, uh, uh, asking me to delay going and running in, in London the next week may, may have, well, it, it, it definitely kept me from witnessing that horrific event and potentially saved me from being injured. Oh, and your family. I just, I can't even imagine. Like I said, you know, we all attend so many events and you and I tend to be on the same circle a lot of times, but that was one story that has always stuck with me because you're right. It was so horrific and it was you know, um, domestic terrorism or whatever you want to call it. And I really think it instilled a lot of fear in people because wasn't the New right. York Marathon coming up after that one? Yeah, the, the um, well, that was in April. And uh, the New York Marathon, of course, was uh, in November. Okay. And the November Marathon, 
it, it, it was the most armed event uh, that I've ever seen in my life. And it just really took away from the spirit of, of health and running and camaraderie that the marathons have um, really uh, inspired. Well, and that's what I want to talk to you about. You know, you are a leader, an absolute thought leader and innovator in the automotive industry. Of course, the success of Paragon has been documented everywhere from automotive news to, I'm sure, the New York Times. I, I would imagine, I'm, I'd imagine everybody has written about you guys. But you are an athlete and you are a marathon runner. And so when people follow you on Facebook, they see your passion for athleticism. So how do you put that passion and with success, like, do you think that the, that the two are intertwined? Well, that, that's, let me uh, start out with how, how I became a runner, because I think it's really a great automotive story. Um, I was at the sales meeting in Boca Raton that was um, a Honda Zone event, and they flew the dealers down to Boca Raton, and Jay Kremens was speaking at the meeting. And at the same time, coincidentally, my business partner, Paul Singer, was suffering from uh, lung cancer. And one of his goals was to beat the lung cancer and to once again run the New York City Marathon. He had run it before. And I, I, uh, when he was ill, I did not take a day off. I worked every day of the year. I think I took 13 days off for the entire year while I stood guard like I was supposed to. And uh, in early uh, March of 2016, um, my uh, Jake Crimmins at his meeting told us about this Fred and Dick Hoyt. And Fred Hoyt uh, was a runner and he would run with his son in a, in a wheelchair. And it was such an inspiring video showing how many marathons and triathlons that they've done. Literally a triathlon where he takes his son, puts him in a raft behind him and swims with a harness for the two miles. And then takes his son out of that, puts him on the bicycle and bicycles for 112 miles. Then he puts his son in a, in, a, in a stroller type event and pushes them for the 26 miles. And I thought at that moment that I wasn't doing enough for my boss. And I said, um, uh, I wanted to uh, run a marathon. Uh, and I, I didn't, he was alive at the time. And uh, in March of 2016, uh, at, excuse me, 2006, I um, made a decision that I was going to run the New York City Marathon. I had not run a mile since high school. Oh my and gosh. I started training in March. My partner passed away in May, and I ran my first marathon uh, in November of 2006. And I have to tell you, the power of a meeting. I went to a sales meeting. And so, Lisa, the stuff that you're doing, uh, and to a lesser extent, some of the stuff that I'm doing, we, we influence lives. And I, and I told, I had the pleasure of speaking on stage with Jay Kremens many years later. And he didn't know, but I said, Jay, you may not know this, but about 10 years ago, you changed my life. And he looked at me and he was surprised. I said, we were at a meeting and told him that story. And I said, and because of that, now I've, I've run 23 or 24 marathons. I said, Jay, it was because of that meeting. And not only running, because who cares about my running, uh, but it's the incredible people that I've met while doing that. You know, because, you know, people that do events like marathons and triathlons, they're a unique breed. They're a bit crazy. But there are also people that have a determination and dedication. And I think that's the same as uh, many successful businessmen and women today. There's nobody that got to the top of their profession uh, without giving up some things. And you've got to sort of make that decision. If I'm going to be a business leader, if I'm going to take my big idea and put it forward out there, that, that may also mean that you're going to have to give up some other things that uh, other people might not be willing to give up. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And, you know, I always talk about business. And, of course, I'm not a marathon runner, nor do I claim to be. I only run if I'm being chased. But um, I do like to consider business, um, you know, uh, as, as being a marathon and not a sprint. Because Absolutely. I do see so many people in either whether it's our industry, automotive, or all the other industries that I work in, you know, they, they, you know, they give up early. And my dear friend Sharon Lecter, the author of um, Three Feet from Gold, and it was a Napoleon Hill book that she brought back. And what the book talks about and Hill talks about and what she talks about in the book is that the majority of people will stop three feet from gold. They, you know, they go 97% and something stops them. They get stuck and then they're done. And so, you know, what I've always learned and what I've always believed about that is if you're willing to push through and do that three extra See, 97% of the people are going to stop there. So then the 3% of us get to go grab the gold, right? 
And I think that's something really important today with millennials. I don't know that they understand how to power through sometimes when we're up against some tough stuff, you know, whether it's the automotive industry, if it's a stop sell, if it's a recall, you know, it does this with the economy, all kinds of stuff can happen. So what is your opinion about that? You know, how do you, how do you teach your sales teams and your, and your managers how to power through the tough stuff? I would tell you there's a great uh, video on YouTube, Art Williams, and he talks about just do it, right? And he talks about the difference between winners and losers in life and, and those that really make it, the difference between a $50,000 a year salesperson and a $500,000 a year salesperson. And, and, and the difference is the winners do it and just a little bit more. And, and, and they do it and a little more and a little more in life and business when they're exercising, when they're, they're working. And that, that 97%... Uh, I, I don't think most people get anywhere near 97%, but you're right. It's not supposed to be easy, Lisa. The, the, all of the obstacles in life are there to make you quit. And, and, and the rewards are there for those that don't. It is an obstacle course. And so, you know, I, I think those of us that have had some success and, uh, and uh, are those that can push through, it's absolutely a marathon and a marathon you've got to learn how to manage resources over a long period of time so you know we all we've all met that sales team or manager who's a 30-day or a 90-day wonder and, right. and you know, sales go through the roof uh, temporarily but they can't sustain it well that's not you can't build a business on that or, or on people like that you need somebody that knows how to do this over a period of time and I remember uh, a couple of months ago a dealer finished ahead of us and he was really excited you know we beat your store and I said did you? I said, we beat your store last month. And I said, who's measuring this by one month? I'm measuring this by decades. Nice. We had the 10-year performance and the 10-year performance you know, in, in the future. I'm not, you know, the 30-day is, is a short-term uh, measurement. But, but, you know, it's one mile out of 26. And so, you, you know, you may uh, uh, pass me at mile four or five. I'll see you at mile 18, 19. Well, that separates the the men from the boys, the, the, the good the, from the great, you know, and, and at mile 17, 18, when I passed that gentleman by smiling, uh, you know, it's a, you put the work in, you, you know, it's, it's impossible not to get out at the start of a race and be excited. You're, you're filled with carbohydrates, you're trained, you're okay. And, and, you know, many a, a person has messed up their marathon by going out too fast. And many a business person goes out there, and they're all excited initially, uh, and you know. And I guess it's easy to to to, to win or to, to have enthusiasm when the cheerleaders are cheering and the crowd is 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 clapping. What do you do when you're alone? What do you do at mile 16 or 17 when you when you've run out of glycogen in your liver and your muscles and you hit that proverbial wall? What do you do to push through that? That's when we'll see what you're made of. When you've dug that 97 percent of the mind and you, you, your body says stop, quit, and there's something inside of those people that say push a little bit more. So do you think the marathon training that you did and being involved in the marathons, do you think that that, it sounds like, has it, has it helped you with mental endurance also when it comes to this up business called the automotive business? Without question. I mean, uh, Paragon's been on a very good run uh, since that period of time, you know, the passing of my, my partner was one of the major tragedies in my life. And, yeah. and um, I, you know, I get choked up thinking about it now, thinking about how much more we could have been doing if he was still around. It, it, it really forced me to grow up as a man and, and as a business person uh, because I felt the weight of his business on, on his his wife's shoulders and on my shoulders, you know, I, I th this is it's it's on me now to make sure I don't let him down, and and I think that's really uh, been a very big part of our success is is not just doing it for for me, but doing it for for us. You know, I think a week or two ago I saw a Facebook post by his grandson who I know works for you, and how he just honored you about how you have helped build him. Uh, and helped him become the man that he is today. I know he's a young man. I, I'm sure he's in his early 20s or mid-20s, but it was really nice to see because, you know, I, I know how much you think of the singers, and I know uh, that Mrs. Singer is still involved somewhat in the store, but to have that two generations down, to be able to look at the boss, which is you, and to be able to appreciate your love of their family and their legacy 
Um, I, it was really touching. In fact, I meant to text you and I didn't, and I'm sorry because I thought, you know, that's probably one of the nicest posts I've ever seen and mm -hmm. an honor to a great leader. Isn't it, isn't it our responsibility to hand the baton to those, you know, the, the next in line? And, and to, you know, I, I, I live by a couple of philosophies, and one of them is to leave it better than you found it. And whether that's a, 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 a hotel room or a house that you leased or a car, leave it better than you found it. And, and when it comes to business, that's really important. You know, I have an obligation to take uh, what, what I've been honored to have and to do the best I can to make it better than the way I got it so I can hand it off to the next generation. And this concept of ownership, um, as a, I have a quick funny story. I, I don't think you own anything, you know, even if you are the owner. And I say that because I own a house in upstate New York that was built in 1836. Wow. I bought the house, and it was a beautiful old uh, house. And when I did a title search, I, I received the title uh, and all the people that have owned that house since 1836. And I realized that although I was the owner of the house, I was really nothing more than a caretaker. Mm -hmm. And I had the house for about 20 years and I just recently sold it. So now I'm on that little chart there that I took care of that house from this period to this period. And I can say I left that house better than I found it. And the, I, I, I ran into the new owners not too long ago. And I, I told them, take care of the house. It's such a beautiful house. And I, I think it's true with just about anything. If you're running a business, you, you know, you're going to own it uh, for a period of time. And maybe you're going to pass it down to your next generation. Or maybe you're going to sell it. And you, you're the caretaker of that business for the time that you're blessed to be in charge of it. And I'm, I'm blessed to have a small role in uh, Paragon right now. And I'm going to do my very best to make sure that I, uh, when my time comes to pass it down or over to somebody else, if they get it better than uh, the best it can be. But you know, that's such, that's such a great philosophy. And like I said, when I read that young man's post, is his name Julian? Am I getting, am I getting that right? Oh, okay. There you go. Right? Oh, Julian. Yeah. And when I read his post, I thought, you know, I mean, those of us in the auto industry, there's, we, have, we always have opinions about the dealer's kids or grandkids. You know, they typically are not um, as gracious as Julian was in that post. And, you know, it was just really the sign of great leadership because I think once we get to a certain point in life and a certain age in life, it isn't about us anymore. It's really about what sort of legacy are we going to leave for those that follow us or that work for us. Um, because, you know, neither one of us will known? work forever, do we? Right. What do you want to be known for? What do you stand for? You know, right. and it's a great old Jim Rohn question. You know, and I, if, if, when I ask myself that question, I want to be known for somebody that worked really hard. I want to be known for giving it my all. You may, you may uh, reject my opinions, uh, but you won't reject my sincerity and or my passion when I'm talking about something I believe in. And I could be completely wrong, but I, I assure you if I'm saying it, I believe it. And I believe it with all my heart. And when I don't believe it, I, I won't say it. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to talk about that because I had uh, the other day on my show, Mr. Bob Berg, and he has written over a million books, uh, The Go-Giver. And, you know, I need to make an introduction between the two of you. In fact, he's probably one of the nicest guys you ever want to meet. But I'll tell you this, and something he wrote a blog, and I even posted it because it was so fantastic. It seems like we live in a country today that we cannot have a respectful conversation if we disagree. And, you know, it has to get into insults and things like that, you know. What is your opinion on the fact that, that Americans, that if you and I happen to disagree, that we can't have that conversation, stick it on the shelf and still be friends. We have to, you know, name call or, or put people into categories or whatever. I know myself, after the State of the Union address, I, I posted, you know, there were some things I loved, there's some things I didn't love or whatever. But the most interesting thing to me was, was the conversation that happened after the fact. And I'll tell you, I ended up blocking about three people and, and I didn't agree with every conversation on there, but a good friend of mine and she and I have to fundamentally agree to disagree. But, but, you know, but we can do that in a respectful way and we can still be friends because it's okay. Because a year from now I might think something differently. What are your thoughts about that? But we cannot as Americans have conversations and be civil. Well, I, I think we're missing out on a big opportunity. I mean, I, there was always a healthy, you know, it's healthy to vet out ideas. The, the colleges used to be a place where ideas were exchanged and let the better ideas stand out. And, you know, the, the 
the, a, a right-leaning opinion and a left-leaning opinion could be debated back and forth, and, and, and one would state their position. Whether we're talking about a, a communism and capitalism, and it, it's a good, healthy argument for both sides to get that vetted out. And I, I think that's being shut down today, and it's sad. I know that after the State of the Union address, I had some opinions on what was being said, and I, I held back posting them uh, because I don't want to turn 50% of my, my friends off, or maybe a greater percentage of that, by, by, by comments one way or the other. And I think that's sad. I think that's sad that I'm self-monitoring uh, what I post and I don't post for fear of reprisal. And I can tell you that um, some of our candidates today uh, political and otherwise are very polarizing and yeah. while they have some good ideas some of their other ideas uh, if you align yourself with that individual can really cause someone to look at you with a jaundice eye. Um, I loved President Obama. I thought he was such a soft-spoken eloquent man. I hated his policies. You know, so it's 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 impossible. I can't win that argument. If I, hate, if I hate his policies somebody may think it's because of his skin color it has nothing to do with that. You know, I, I, I thought that was a great moment for America that, that we elected an African-American president. I thought that was a great milestone for America. I don't particularly think he was uh, a great president, but I think he was a, a, a very nice man. I think he made a very good appearance for the United States of America. He inspired a lot of, um, uh, you know, people that were not, that are just not white male to jump out. Imagine and, that. and that right there could be his legacy. Can you imagine what, what that meant to such a large portion of the uh, population? You know, we were always told when you were a kid that you could go up to be president, and I don't think that was real for females. I don't think that was real. It hasn't you know, been real for females. You don't want to well, go there with me. <laughs> well, well, listen, this, this go around, it was good that it wasn't. I, you know, I love more. Agree. Agree. I will not argue that one. So it, it's, it's not, uh, we weren't qualified. But, but the fact that he became president uh, inspired a whole portion of the nation. Uh, and I think that's really a great story for America. And, and it's about time with that. Right. And you know, and one of the things that concerns me, and you have children, like you have a daughter, Clementine, who if I ever get back to New York, I'm taking her, I'm putting her in my suitcase, and I'm kidnapping her. Yeah. She's Absolutely the cutest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And of course, I know your wife just must dote over her because you look at her clothes and her costumes and all of that. Um, but my concern with the dialogue that's going on in the United States today is, you know, there, first of all, there's such a problem with bullying anyways, whether it's in the schools or if it's online um, and all of that. And so when, when young people or in millennials, you know, when they see bullying and whether it's the president acting like a bully from the pulpit or it's the other side not standing up to acknowledge, I mean, I felt like there was bullying on both sides, you know, more passive aggressive from one side than the other or whatever but it doesn't matter but do you what kind of message are we sending your sweet little clementine that that about about you know the lack of communication the the lack of uh, people being able to work together and then and then just bullying in general do you see it that way or is well, it yeah you know I, I think the uh again i don't want to get too political but i think the president uh has a lot of fence mending to do and you know there there are those that won't ever allow him to do that. I, I get it. He came on a bit caustically, um, but but it, it, going to bully. But Brian, I have to say because I don't want our listeners to think that this is uh, anti-Trump or pressure. I think many presidents, right and left, Congress uh, and the Senate, you know, they get polarized in this is where we're at today, and versus coming together and having conversations. They sit and they bully each other with negative responses and negative remarks. But what do you think it's doing to our kids? What message are we sending our children? I mean, you and I communicate for a living. This is how we make our money. Yeah. And so, but what message are, are we sending, you know, your daughter and, and your young children? Well, I, I think kids, you know, you've got a couple of things going on. They're divisive, they're polarizing, yet they're, uh, you know, they, they say the term snowflake. Uh, and, and I think you're seeing a lot of people that are not used to, uh, being critiqued and criticized, and when they get that, they don't know how to react. And I think you know, there's some startling numbers on teen suicides and cyberbullying. Terrible. That people need to be uh, uh, aware of. And, and I, I try not to get into these online debates because a, there's no purpose to change anyone's mind, and b, all you're going to do is turn people off. I, I ask myself, whatever happened to the days of Tip O'Neill and, and, and Ronald Reagan uh, having differences of opinion and fighting? 
uh, and then going out for beer. And yeah, I, yeah. I mean, that, that was such a great camaraderie. And, you know, I even look at, at Clinton, uh, President Clinton and President George W. Bush. They're the best of friends. I mean, they yeah, are together yeah, all the time. So, okay, so switching from politics, I want to talk about negotiating because I do think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm personally very passionate about communication skills and I'm a speaker and an author and you're a speaker and you, you have got to write a book someday. So I'm going to say potential author. Um, but that being said, you know, when we're trying to teach, you know, I know that you must have millennials on your sales team and the art sure. of negotiation. How do you, because what I found when I had a millennial sales team, they weren't really very wild about negotiating and it had to do with communication skills. And then they also saw it as being argumentative almost. And I take it back to, I think what they see going on in pop culture today Whereas when you and I got in the car business, I got in in 1985. I mean, I was excited. Like, it was like, I'm going to win or you're going to win, but let's go. So, 1985. I was going to say that's a long time ago, but then I just realized I got back, I got into it in 1982. Uh, <laughs> I was still in high school back then, old man, just saying. So let's, let's talk about that. A, let's not paint these millennials with one brush, okay? Because I had a young man that worked for me named Jason Graciano, and he was a super hardworking millennial. He became a bull, a superstar. He, he ingested material that we shared with his good brain, and he took them and he imparted it on his other, his teammates that were also millennials. These millennials were absolute beasts, and they work hard. Uh, we can't blame the millennials for not understanding the car business. The car business has been wrong. The car business has been wrong for years. You know, it used to be when a, a millennial would come to work for us, uh, we would spend training time teaching them why it takes four hours to deliver a car. And he'd scratch them, well, I don't get it. I don't get it. And they were right and we were wrong. And after two, three, four, five weeks, we'd teach them why it took four or five hours to get a car. Instead of fixing that and saying, you know, you're right. Uh, and, you know, it's tough to listen to a kid who's got pimples on his face or her face and, you know, 18 years old and no experience. But they're right because they're not experiencing that friction in other things that they do. When they want to buy something, there's no friction. They just buy it and it gets delivered to them. And then we teach them, no, 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 here, we bring them into this antiquated system. And I'm sitting in an office with a antiques and stuff and I have a deep respect for our past. But I also have a wild excitement about our future. And the future is frictionless. That's where we're going with this. And so if the millennials uh, coming into the sales business struggle to negotiate with customers, it's because they're, they're not used to it. And, it's, and, and you know, negotiation is a part of life. And I do believe the young uh, generation needs to learn that uh, to, to negotiate. But negotiating can be, do you want uh, a battery with a six-hour life, 12-hour life, 24-hour life. It shouldn't be OK Corral, where uh, let, the KBM tour let the you know the strong survive and let the best you know let the business get away with what they can get away with. Uh, and and I think that the, the millennials are right, and maybe the way that you and I have been doing it, which was right for the time, is not correct for this time. Well, I love I got you so fired up, and I am a fan of millennials because my my millennial sales team in 2012 broke the world sales record. So. Absolutely, I, I believe, but I will tell you that they did it for different reasons. You know, they did it because they, you know, they were, we were very purpose driven. Our purpose was to revolutionize the auto industry and to show the world that women, millennials, and minorities could do it um, with a very small car and a very small space. But that was always their driver. And that's what I love about millennials. But don't, and you are a big inspiration. But I think as these businesses and people watch this show, one of the things they've got to understand is, you know, when I was talking to my team and saying, you know, this is our opportunity, you know, this is, this is, this is why I want to break the world sales record. Lisa, I want to meet the chairman of the board. But for you, all of you, I want to give you something to think about. This is an honor because it'll be you guys that do it, not me. I will just have the privilege to say that I led the team that broke the world sales record. But sure. you'll be able to put it on your resume. You'll be able to tell this story the rest of your life. It'll be nothing anybody can take away from you. And that fired them up way more than they might make another thousand dollars because they sold more cars or you or sold like I don't know, some stupid amount of fiats. I mean <laughs> uh, 
Don't, oh. don't be hating on my Fiat's. Oh, I still my. have a big, I have mad love for that brand. And to me, Fiat's in Texas. I don't get that. So uh, that, that's, that's pretty cool. I saw you had a pink Fiat, didn't you? I did. Yes, Mr. Marchione built it for me. In fact, um, it is on loan to our dear friend Josh Tobin in Las Vegas in his car museum because I didn't see a reason for me to drive around in a pink Fiat in Austin, Texas. Well, if, not, if not, if Josh wants to, let him get it to me for my daughter Poppy. My daughter Poppy loves pink. It'd be perfect car. Well, for you, you should you should send him a note. I mean that that car was painted with Lamborghini paint and the whole bit. It was pretty special. So you ought to send your friend Josh Tobin a note about that. My, my, my fear is that he might say yes and sell it to me. I think he would. <laughs> he said, Lisa, I don't know what I'm going to do with the pink car, he said. But, you know, so Josh and I had the only two cars ever built for dealers by FCA when, when Josh was the number one Dodge dealer in the world in 2016. The same guy that built me my, my pink car, Tim Kaniskas, built Tobin a Hellcat. And I said, okay, how did I get a pink Fiat and you got the last most famous Hellcat in production? And, you know. It is what it is, but anyway, so he uh, he had thought that, that, that those those two cars should be married forever, and I happily yeah. took his money. Let's let's jump back to millennials for a second. Who's to blame for the millennials? Their Wouldn't parents, be, us. Yeah, yeah, us. Right? Because we wanted them. You busted your tail working, and I'm busting my tail working, and we want our kids to have it easy. And so now we're angry at them for wanting it easy when we made it easy for I them. I know. The the what dictates the work ethic of the millennial more often than not is the family that they came from and right. and the upbringing and you know my uh, my my partner made me walk on glass and and uh, and, and crawl through uh, a barbed wire fence to get to the position that I'm in now and thank goodness and I you know I struggle with that with his grandson because I, you know I've I've got this young man and I, I think you know I, I use the term metaphorically that part of my job is to make him strong uh, to face the real world, right? And that's sometimes, that's, it, you, you know how you learn to take punches? You get punched. And it's a tough, you know, it's tough to tell my partner, hey, here's what I have to do in order to develop him. By the way, you know, you're, you're, I took a couple of thousand punches in my day uh, growing up in the industry from my mentor. And, and, and again, uh, we, we have to be respectful to all people, uh, male, female, and, right. and business. And uh, yelling and screaming and uh, that stuff really doesn't have a place. But sometimes the hard facts uh, need to be told. And I think we have an obligation when we're teaching uh, any uh, sales team, you know, here are the facts of life. Here's what's going to happen outside. If you don't pull the weeds out of your garden, they'll take the garden. Irrespective of your desire or your wish, they will take the garden because that's what weeds do. And, and your competition will take your salesmen if you don't protect them and treat them right because that's what the competition is supposed to do. The competition is there to prove you wrong. And, and, and so we have to step up to the game and, and make sure that we're taking care of our garden. What is your number one challenge today? And, and I'm not talking about being number one or number, one through five. That's tough. That's, I know, I walked that one for four years. But what is your number one challenge today as a general manager running a very high volume car dealership? Having my foot in the present and my eyes in the future. You know, it's uh, because I think they're two different business models and I, I have to maintain uh, the current business model because it pays the bills. And, and that business model uh, we've, we've had a very good level of success with over the years. While I look at where, where are the trends in uh, transportation and how do I prepare our business uh, and our businesses and our staff for those changes that are taking place, whether that's fractional uh, ownership, whether that's uh, 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 the Uber type or Lyft type rides or Zipcar type rides, uh, uh, flexible drive uh, uh, applications, fare, uh, autonomous, uh, Tesla, franchise systems changing. Uh, there's, there are a lot of different variables going on at one time. And you know, so right now, uh, constant education of myself and my staff to be able to move in the direction that we think the industry is going quickly, uh, I think is the biggest challenge that all of us are facing right now. Okay, so I wanna ask you about that because there is a fine line. As the leader, I think we have to be constantly immersed in what's going on in the trends and things like that. For myself, um, I struggled with it back in the day when, when we launched Flex Drive, first store in the country to do it, to 
to keep my my team and my organization moving forward to do like you said the model that we know that pays the bills and but to, to try to keep them on the cutting edge but sometimes you know they would they would go a little too far out on the cutting edge and then this would suffer over here how do you balance that like in any business you know the, the leader has got to be the visionary but do you agree that sometimes we can overshare the vision and it, it kind of you know stops the momentum of the team has that ever happened to you it happened to me I would say uh, you can't overshare the vision enough. You know, I think, you know, you have to share the vision. You've got the, the, the four E's. One is to, to envision. What is your vision of the business and the future? Two is to energize, right? You've got the vision. Now you've got to turn your team on. Hey, here's what we're going to do. Here's what's in it for you. The third E is to execute. Okay, now here's the plan. Here's the vision. You're, you're energized. I'm energized. Let's execute. And the fourth E is to prepare to exit you know at some point i'm going to do what i do i'm going to do it properly and then hand it over to the next generation when it's that time and so this process doesn't happen overnight your point is well taken if i'm talking about selling cars in 2020 the salesperson's concerns are probably what's my paycheck going to be next week boss and how do we take care of that and 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 i, and I think the market is moving rapidly and slowly at the same time um, I'm not sure the customers are 100% ready to do 100% of a transaction online and mass. Remember, customers don't trust automobile dealers. And the fact that we're doing it online doesn't make us more trustworthy to most customers. It's when the OEMs get together with the dealers to have a comprehensive plan where you've got fair pricing for everybody, you've got consistent pricing for everybody, that the customers will feel more comfortable doing this, right? I feel very comfortable buying an iPhone from Apple online. It's the same price everywhere. And it's the same price if I go into the store or buy it online. So now the, you've taken away that uh, fear. suspicion and the fear. And, and so we've got a ways to go before we get there, but I think we're, we're moving in that direction. Um, what happens I, I, when, when Amazon, because Amazon's a very trusted brand. I mean, the UPS guy and I are on, the, I mean, he's at my house four times a day sometimes. You know, Prime box this, Prime box that, because that's where I buy everything. What is your opinion? And, and we know it's coming. What will happen when Amazon gets in the car business? I mean, really gets in the business. What will that look like for the bricks and mortar dealer? Just your opinion. Well, uh, we're seeing Amazon is, uh, they tried 100% no bricks and mortar. Now they're moving to bricks and mortar. Uh, I think there needs to be a combination of, uh, of the two. Uh, one of the uh, big online brokerage firms, uh, when they tried setting up uh, initially, I had it where you had they had no locations and they needed that location for the trust factor uh, for their clients. So I think well, I think that Amazon will end up buying a, a major platform, you know, a, an auto nation or whatever. Trying to start rumors here, but you know what I'm saying, you know, a, a major. So because of course with a car you have to have a place of origin. You you got to be able to service it. But do you know Amazon? Because you said, and I agree with you a million percent, that car dealers have a hard time with the consumer trusting them. Will the consumer trust them more if, if it becomes Amazon Chevrolet, Amazon Toyota? Do you think that that will disrupt the standard car dealer? You know, I, I, I think it's an interesting question. Smarter people than, uh, than me are trying to figure it out. But I, I, I do think that Amazon will be involved in the business. Uh, I do think that customers uh, who shop are going to find that Amazon's not the low-cost producer. Amazon's not the low cost provider right now of anything that they're providing online. They just knock the customers out with customer service. So we're trying to have that customer service piece now. So there's less of a differentiation between what the customers uh, can expect from an auto dealer and what they can expect from Amazon. If we were to take the standard business model now and the potential of what Amazon can do coming into this business, that disruptive gap, uh, is going to make it very easy for automobile dealers to be in trouble. You know, look at uh, uh, Whole Foods acquisition. Uh, the, the notion of needing to go to a, a, a supermarket is crazy. I, 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 I tell the story. I went to NYU uh, to learn about disruption. And I went back to school, and, and the professor asked us to design a shopping cart. Uh, the shopping cart hasn't changed in a hundred years and we broke into groups of five and I drew one box and I drew another box and I drew an arrow going from one to the other and I said here it is and the group said what the heck is that and I said it's the answer 
And they said, uh, okay. And I got many of the other questions right, so they trusted me. And I turned it into the professor. He looked at it and said, what the heck is this? And I said, well, that's my redesign. He goes, well, what is it? Explain it. I said, well, it's a building. And from your building, you order the food. And then they, from the supermarket, they ship that right to you. And he said, but the assignment was to redesign the shopping cart. And I said, but the answer is uh, to eliminate the shopping cart. That's the best redesign. And, and was that prior to the Amazon acquisition? One day prior. Swear to God. And the <laughs> funniest thing, uh, he, he told me that it was the wrong answer. I did not do the assignment correctly. And the next day I emailed him and said, the wrong answer was worth $28 billion. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Boom. Uh, let's walk through that. Let's walk through the shopping cart because I think it's really important for our automobile uh, dealers to to listen to this craziness. If I'm in a, a, a suburb like uh, Texas, uh, Austin, Texas, and I go to the supermarket, I leave my house, I go to the supermarket, I park my car, I get out of my car, I get a shopping cart. I go through the aisles in the supermarket, I load up my shopping cart. They strategically place the vegetables on one side and the dairy products on the other, so I've got to go through the whole supermarket. And I go through the supermarket and I load up my shopping cart. Now what do I do? I check out. What do I do when I check out? When I check out, I unload the shopping cart. Once I've unloaded the shopping cart, I pay. Now what do I do? I reload the shopping cart. Now what do I do? I take the shopping cart, go out to my car. Then what do you do? I unload the shopping cart, put it into my car, and I drive home. Then what do you do? I unload my car, and I bring it into the house. Isn't the best redesign of the shopping cart the elimination? Just have the food brought to the house. And manage the variables. And the variables are uh, Lisa Copeland and her family probably eat very similar things month to month. So it's very predictable. And so now all you have to do is ma manage the exceptions. You've got a dinner party, so you want extra whatever it is you would have at a dinner party. You're having friends over, you need extra that. We still have some eggs, so we don't need eggs this week. And you can manage the, the exceptions. And I think if we can start behaving like this, uh, and, and say the best redesign of the sales process might very well be the elimination of the sales process. Right. And we as dealers can get our arms around that. Stop tweaking it. Stop taking it from four hours to three and a half hours and thinking you've done something. And Stop. 10 steps to eight steps. Who cares? Right, right. exactly right. And, and, and now instead of having a, a, a bottled water, we've got canned water. And, and we've got better coffee. They don't want to come to your service department. They don't want to wait in your service waiting room. They don't want to drink your bad coffee. They don't want to watch whatever you've got on television, Fox News or CNN or Jerry Springer or Moesha. They don't want to watch that. They, they've got other things to do. And as nice as we've tried to make our customer service lounges, and, and they're not ours are nice, the customer still doesn't want to be there. So why don't we make better use of the customer's time pick up the car, service it, bring it back to them, and provide even higher transparency while we're doing that. I know. And so uh, kind of wrapping up, but I, I, I have to ask, when, when did it become your burning desire, your mission to, uh, you know, when, when, how did Paragon Direct come into fruition? I mean, was there a day? Was there an event? Was it something you've been thinking about and now you've executed? Like, what, what was the event? What was the defining moment? You know, uh, there's always an event, right? There's always a moment. Let me say that in 2010, we started uh, the concept of the store without walls and, uh, and, and selling a car completely online. And the technology wasn't quite there. And while you could purchase the car online, you couldn't legally do it uh, per se. We didn't have methods of collecting the money and conducting the finance. And over the years, uh, that's changed. And then, you know, you take the other technologies that have come into play, like uh, an Uber type application where uh, the customer can see the vehicle being brought to them. So you make better use of their time. We've taken these technologies and some of the advances in online um, uh, purchasing uh, from some of the other manufacturers. And, and now we're, we're engaging in that in, in our sales uh, transaction. The, the, the moment, though, was um, a Honda dealership an Acura dealership, a Nissan dealership, a Volvo dealership in Manhattan going out of business. Oh, my and God. Four of them? Oh, my God. In Manhattan, five miles away. And we're saying, if it can happen to them. Right. It can happen to us. 
And, and why did it happen? I mean, there's a lot of money in Manhattan. Why are car dealerships not making it in Manhattan? Because it's so darn expensive to do business. And the amount of real estate that we require is, is, is just unbelievable for, a, for a, a city like New York. The other thing is that the people in Manhattan don't need cars. Exactly. They don't need to own cars. Uh, uh, they, they need transportation, but they don't need cars. They're consuming their transportation differently. So I, 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 I think I had an early indication that uh, there could be storm clouds on the horizon. And, you know, the time could... For, for, for Paragon Honda, because you're saying Manhattan is five miles away and these four brands have closed their doors. Right. right. And, and I know that they're going to try and open up again, but, you know, whomever is going to operate there is going to be faced with the same difficulties that the prior owners face. The prior owners, and I know several of them are good people. You know, yeah. And nothing wrong. It's just you've got a hand that you can't win. Uh, and, and so I, I, the, the saying, the time to repair the roof is while the sun is shining. The yeah. sun, sun is shining. We've got a good economy. We've got low unemployment, uh, historically low interest rates still. And while those facts are still facts, we need to make sure that we're preparing for what the next leg of the automobile industry looks like. And Lisa, that's what I'm trying to do. And I know that's what you're trying to do as well. Well, I I, not only are you trying to do it, and what I have always admired about you, you know, you're not just up there talking about it. You're doing it. You know, and, and I, what, what has been one bump that you guys have experienced with, you know, you know, trying new technology and trying to um, uh, create this frictionless buying experience? Just throw it out there. One, one, one little bump in the road. There had to have been one. Probably I'll give you a small one. I'll give you a small one. <laughs> it's expensive. Oh, um, money. You're making mistakes. And those mistakes cause, you know, uh, cost money. Uh, we're up against companies like Amazon that don't care whether or not they make a profit. Uh, I, I'm told Tesla hasn't made a profit at no. all. Ever. They've lost billions of dollars. I mean, I, I, I can tell my wife, last year Paragon made more than the Tesla Corporation. And she's like, really? Yeah, because they lost several. <laughs> I was about to say, all of us made more than Tesla last year. That's right. But so imagine that you're up against a competitor that's incredibly smart. And, you know, if we're going to talk about the people behind it, Jeff Bezos is brilliant and Elon Musk is, you know, is super brilliant. And we're up against these guys with all of these resources and they don't care about profit. And I'm sure they care on some level, but they're not worried about the profitability. You and I, uh, as automobile dealers, we have to worry about that profit every 30 days. So the big difficulty is expensive when you're working on technology and solutions for the uh, consumer. And little by little, we're, we're getting the cost down. Little by little, uh, we're getting an ROL, the return on learning. Uh, but that, that, like, like all of your education, that learning comes at an expense. And you've got to be willing to pay that price in advance to play in that field. All right, so Brian, in closing, we, we've talked about the automotive industry. We, we've talked about why you've done what you've done. But our, our big takeaway every time on this show is I ask my guest, what is the one big idea? What is the one thing that you could leave with the viewers and the listeners that they could enact in their business tomorrow? The future is frictionless. The question that dealers are still trying to answer, should we be selling cars online, is a question that is, um, the, well, the answer is, of course. And now it's how quickly can we move into a frictionless, transparent business model. And isn't that every business, whether you sell skirts or pencils online or whatever it may be, is that the consumers expect you know, to be on demand, to be transparent, and to be frictionless. And so anyways, it's always, it's always great talking to you. You've been ahead of the curve. What do you see Brian Benstock doing five years from now? Um, in an ideal world, um, I doing what I'm doing right now. I love what I do. You know, I, I, you know, I, I always ask what I do it if there was no money involved and you know, don't I, lie to I, us, Brian. I, I want to be in a position where the money is meaningless. I just lo love what I'm doing. I love developing people and developing teams. And, um, so I, I want to be able to do what I'm doing, but I want to be able to do it uh, in this frictionless world, maybe from a yacht in the Bahamas. <laughs> You know, you know, it's it's it'll be very interesting to see how we do this uh, five years from now. But I have every intention of being right where I am five years from now, being an automobile dealer and seeing the seeds that I'm planting today, 
having grown into big trees to provide fruit for me to eat from uh, as I watch the next generation take over. Do you want your kids to go into the car business? Do you have any desire or, or do they have any desire? I want my kids to, to follow their passion and their spirit and their heart and wherever it takes them. And if that's in the automobile business, that would be great. But if it's not, you know, I've got five children and, you know, my, my gosh, that you would think they have different parents. They all are very, very different. And I want them to follow their dream and not to try and follow mine. Well, anyways, thank you so much. And so we all agree that no matter what industry you're in, you're watching the show today, is that you've got to commit to um, a frictionless environment for your customer. And I think a frictionless environment for your employees too. We're like, they want to come to work because it's a great place to work. So anyways, Brian, thank you so much for participating in the show. And as, us as usual, you know, we, we're bringing in experts in the art of the big sell and talking about big ideas. And Brian, I'm going to leave you with this. I was sitting here thinking during our conversation, somehow you have to write a book around frictionless experience, but you have to tie in marathon and training for marathons because it was really impactful for me when you said, you know, it's really easy to come quick out of the shoot. Nice to have a competitor's out there and they would say we beat them this month we're so great and I'd say the same thing hey beat me beat me three years in a row and then we're gonna talk about who's really number one you know whatever I, you know we were just obviously congratulations but don't don't get used to this because you know we are we are the marathon and I, I just see you doing that a book being about marathon and, and, and about mile 16 and mile 24 so anyways if that book or when that book becomes a New York Times bestseller I want a piece of it because Maybe. on this show, to... I gave you that idea. But that's so you. So it's a good idea. Yeah. That's great. All right. Well, thank you again. And thank you to everybody for the art of the big sell and to Brian Benstock, the vice president and general manager of Paragon Honda Acura in Queens, New York. If you're out there looking for a car, uh, definitely give Brian a call. And Brian, how can people connect with you? I know that people want to hear your story and learn more about you. ParagonHonda.com or BrianBenstock.com or uh, call my cell phone or call my uh, office. Uh, oh, careful with that cell phone. A lot of people are going to be watching this one. 718-507-5000, <laughs> extension 271. We come on into the store, take a look, take a tour. Uh, we, we love having automobile dealer guests come to the store and see what it's all about. Yes, you are very, very generous with sharing, even with your competitors. All right, Brian, hey, to continued success. Um, hopefully, you. you know, you're going to keep that top five month in, month out, and for the year of 2018. But I would expect nothing less from you and your team. We're going to do, do our very best. Thank you, Lisa. Uh-huh.